Welcome to McCall College's Community Conversations on COVID-19. We're adjusting now to have a conversation on mental health. McCall College offers specialty higher education to all ages in the West Central Mountains. Our May focus for our community conversations center around pandemic-related mental health concerns. Our series goal is to offer education on mental health problems in our area, to also offer strategies for coping with mental health problems, and to offer local and regional resources for help. We are so pleased for our first week to welcome two guests from Central District Health, Courtney Boyce and Christina Perez. And what our conversation tonight will be about is caring for your mental health and discovering regional resources. Courtney, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Courtney Boyce. I'm the Drug Overdose Prevention Program Coordinator at Central District Health. And I'm also the Public Health District Liaison for the District 4 Citizen Review Panel. Wonderful. Thank you and welcome. Christina, would you now introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Perez. I am a coordinator at Central District Health. I coordinate several public health programs, one of them being the Suicide Prevention Program, as well as the Heart Disease, Diabetes, Stroke Prevention Program, and the Cancer Prevention Program. I also serve as a liaison when it comes to COVID-19 efforts with the Hispanic community. Wonderful. We are so appreciative that both of you have taken time tonight out of your very busy schedules to help us with our conversation tonight. And we're talking about behavioral health. So I need a definition. Uh, uh, and so it can come from one or either or just a good conversation. But what is behavioral health? Sure. So the term behavioral health um, from SAMHSA, it means the promotion of mental health. It means resilience and well-being, but it's the treatment of these conditions. So mental health and substance use disorders. And it's also the support of those that experience those conditions and might be in recovery from those uh, conditions, as well as their family members and friends and larger community. Thank you. Now, I have an odd question, but I keep using the term mental health. Um, and so what's the difference between mental health and behavioral health? Are they synonymous? Are they different? Are you preferring to go one or the other? Is it, how is that conversation growing? I think that the term behavioral health is a little bit more inclusive because it includes um, mental health conditions in addition to substance use disorders. And it's a kind of a co-occurring definition of both. But for it, the terms of this, it's either one that you would prefer. I think most people know kind of the general stream of what we were talking about in that subject. Thank you. How has our behavioral health changed in this pandemic? Give, take us up to 10,000 feet. What, what's, what's happening in behavioral health after a year and a half of COVID-19? I'll let Christina go, I'll jump in. Um, I think something that has happened a lot is that there's been a, a social isolation and disconnect from people's normal avenues of communication and connection. So previously, if people were having a difficult time period, for instance, a student, we would encourage them to talk to a trusted adult, but that trusted adult might be a teacher, a counselor, coach, um, that could also be a neighbor. But if they don't have those normal support systems in place to be able to, to talk to those folks, um, due to quarantine or just general uh, community disconnect, it can be really difficult to access the services, know where to get help, and then maintain uh, treatment if treatment is provided to them. So I'll let Christina stay for part two. Thank you. I'm going to send yeah. this one. I'm going to send this one to Christina because it trying to influence people's behavior is such a crucial part of of your work. 
how much can we influence someone else's behavior? Yeah, that is a very good question. And I don't know if I have a direct answer. However, I do know that being able to access resources, being able to access support, that can certainly help influence someone's behavior. Um, and during this pandemic, a lot of individuals who had their um, scheduled care and they had their care plan, a lot of them found themselves being disrupted by this. Um, so not being able to access those, that care, that support, those resources that people typically would have the option to access, I know definitely impacted behavior health in a very negative way. So again, being able to make sure that these systems are in place, that these resources are in place can definitely help influence or at least impact it in a positive way. Oh, wonderful. Um, and those, those tools and those resources, we will be highlighting at the end of our conversation tonight. And I look forward to making sure that people have access to them. I'm going to, I'm going to focus now on, on Courtney. Your, your area is on drug overdose, but I don't sense I know you very well. Could you give us a little more of your background? And then the question I'd love to that follow with is, how did you get involved into the drug overdose area? So would you give us a bit more of your background? Absolutely. Um, prior to this position, I spent five years working in an inpatient behavioral health facility. So that facility specialized in um, substance use disorders and detoxification of substances, in addition to crisis mental health and psychiatric stabilization. During my time period there, I worked in case management and as a psych tech. So I was really closely working with clients during the duration of their care and helping uh, create comprehensive discharge plans as they were released out to the community. That work inspired me to get into public health. And during my time period there, I went back to school. I got my master's of public health through ISU. And then shortly after that, um, doing internship at CDH, which then led me to start working at CDH. Oh, um, that's wonderful. Yeah. That, that's appreciated. And thank you again for such important work. How has the pandemic influenced our drug availability and trends for our region? And when I say our region, you know, Valley County is where we are, but you're really located in Ada County and you have, you have responsibility really for four uh, regions. So um, you can broaden your answer to wherever you're comfortable or narrow it if you're able to. Um, but, but how has the pandemic influenced the drug availability? Sure. So um, working in the public health field, we do manage each one of our counties, but each county has a different approach and way of addressing substance use. So what is an issue in Ada County might not be an issue in Elmore County. Um, in Valley County, we have a particularly uh, good advantage of being familiar with what's happening there because of our work in the Valley County Opioid Response Project. Um, Central District Health was provided a, a million dollar grant over three years to be able to address substance use just in Valley County and then the outside communities that are um, interacting with Valley County. So as a result of that, um, something that we've kind of seen anecdotally as well as what's happening in our region for how the pandemic has influenced our drug availability is that um, it's disrupted illicit drug supply chains. So people might be using uh, substances from unfamiliar sources. They might be using substances that are available to them that they normally wouldn't use. Um, and they might be diverting to other forms of substance use in, a, in a, an attempt to cope for what's happening at that time. So a, an example of that, because um, it's kind of abstract to talk about it that way, if somebody um, previously received prescription opiates from someone, um, but that person isn't seeing anybody, they're not selling as frequently, any one of those conditions, they're not able to get a prescription or refill from their provider, something like that, they may change their drug of choice to heroin. Um, and we've also seen a shift in fentanyl. We're seeing a high concentration of fentanyl saturated in our drug supply chains. Um, so it's not just uh, in opioids. So previously we were seeing fentanyl and heroin um, and fentanyl is 100 times more potent than heroin. Um, but now we're seeing it in cocaine, we're also seeing it in methamphetamine, and we're seeing it manufactured to be packaged as if it was a prescription benzo. So it's, it's certainly um, saturating our drug supply chain and, and changing the way that substances are being used during the pandemic. Oh my. And those changes add to the risk 
the, the risk just goes up for these people. Uh, and, and that must be a deep concern because of the higher risk for everyone and the challenges that then each person faces. It's true. Um, for folks that normally wouldn't be using opioids, they might not have informed consent to know that they are using opioids. And fentanyl has its own unique risks associated with it in the sense that it is so potent um, and it's very difficult to be able to know for sure that your substance that you're receiving, even if you test it with a fentanyl test strip, that the entire supply hasn't been contaminated with fentanyl. And, and I, again, you may not be able to answer this, but what, what I think came as a surprise to me um, was a conversation I had on needles in a McCall baseball park. And, and that sort of leads me to the question, are, are all of these uh, uh, substances available in McCall in Valley County? Or is this just a big city problem with Boise? What, what, what's, the, what's the reality that we should be aware of in a small town in the middle of central Idaho? Absolutely. The reality is, is very likely uh, fentanyl is going to be in the local drug supply because some of those drug supply chains uh, may have shifted, but fentanyl is smaller. It's easier to carry. You can um, have it be more compact and with your normal supply chains that have less risk in, in that sense, um, since it takes a lot less to be able to achieve a, a normal high for heroin. Um, what I would say to those types of circumstances for people know your source, uh, make sure to use fentanyl test strips, per, um, conduct harm reduction and informed consent around substance use as much as possible. And if you do choose to use, use safely um, and making sure to provide all those other different barriers in place to prevent a fatal overdose from occurring. Um, but if we're seeing it regionally everywhere else around Valley County, it's absolutely in Valley County and something to be a concern for. Thank you, it's so important. What are the historical and current overdose trends that you're seeing that are, are important for us to be aware of in this region? Sure, so I actually have a, a pretty brief um, visual here that's from the CDC that I'll go ahead and share really fast. But essentially during the opioid epidemic, we've had several different waves, if you will, of um, concern. So in the very first part of the 1980s, uh, there was a it's led to steady increase, if you will, of drug overdoses. And a lot of that was attributed to prescription opioid pain medications. And then in the 1990s, we really started to see it hit off. Um, but the second wave um, started in 2010, which you can see here clearly on the chart. Um, so in that second wave, that's when overdose, overdose deaths, excuse me, were starting to be attributed exclusively to heroin. And that was becoming more of a used substance outside of prescription opioids. Um, and then past that, it going into the third wave, that was in 2013, when we really started to see the concern of synthetic opioids. Mm -hmm. So synthetic opioids mean that they're exclusively manufactured, but they can be manufactured in a lab that is a clandestine lab, as well as pharmaceutically manufactured. So fentanyl itself is a prescription medication that people can receive for various different circumstances, but it's also made pretty easily um, in other types of environments. And that's what changed a lot of what we're seeing right now um, in terms of opio opioid overdose deaths and overdose deaths in general. Um, synthetic opioids have continued to be uh, a rise since 2013. And then over uh, 2019, they were responsible for 70% of the deaths is uh, synthetic opioids alone. And we anticipate when new data comes out through the CDC as it's been evaluated over 2020 and even um, in the end of 2019 and early stages of 2021, we're gonna see synthetic opioids being responsible for a large number of fatal overdoses. Mm. My goodness. We live in, er in an area with extraordinarily weak resources. Uh, what are our current resources for handling trends that we're clearly seeing in the country, region and in our cities? Yeah, I think uh, the one of Valley County's largest assets is the community nature. Uh, Valley County is very relational. Um, and as a result of that, it's really important for people to be tapped into a recovery-based community. 
Um, it's just as important for people to tap into that community as it is for the community that's there to tap into that individual. So an example of that is the recovery oriented community center um, that is recently developed in Valley County. It's located um, right behind um, Albertsons and McCall and it serves all of Valley County. Um, and they have peer support specialists, recovery coaches, recovery oriented physical activities, peer support groups, um, mutual aid that they provide there. That's a phenomenal asset and something that was a gap prior to its development this last year. Um, and then there's also regional based resources that serve a lot of Valley County. So St. Luke's Cascade Medical Center, the Change Clinic that's in Donnelly is a medication assisted therapy clinic, which is an evidence based practice that we would certainly recommend people explore. Uh, Central District Health, we're located in McCall as well. And then for general counseling services, there's Central Idaho Counseling, Integrity Mental Health, and then a recent, um, a recently developed initiative from Courtney Hill, who's out of the Cascade Medical Center, is the McCall Mobile uh, Medicine Clinic, which is able to use their own transportation systems to go directly to people and meet them where they're at and provide services, which is phenomenal and, and really an asset to us in a time like this. Yeah, so there's a lot of different strategies in place. I, I went by the Mobile Medical Clinic today, and I'm not even sure where I saw it. Um, but I was going, huh, what's that? And so thank you, that, that's, uh, that's so helpful. And Recovery Oriented Community, short name is The Rock. The Rock. And um, The Rock is a brand new organization. And in week four, we've invited them to, uh, to participate in the community conversations. I sure hope they can. Uh, it sounds like they're a wonderful resource that we all need to get to know better. And so thanks for highlighting those. We usually lack treatment centers, um, and so I appreciate what we have, but oh my, uh, how do we make up for the weaknesses that a, a resort rural area has in Idaho? What are, what are the strategies we can use to overcome uh, those weaknesses and those missing links? Sure. Um, I think the opposite of a substance use disorder is connection. So using the strengths of the community to be able to help support an individual in every stage of their use um, from that community-based level. From a treatment perspective, it's encouraging that providers um, be prescribed in buprenorphine, which is an evidence-based practice, encouraging them to introduce more behavioral health treatment services in their clinic settings, um, encouraging uh, the crossover or co-occurring co management of treatment uh, conditions, and making sure that the infrastructure that you do have in terms of counseling and emergency room services and behavioral health services is as, as robust as it can be to try to maintain an educated workforce that's uh, familiar with best practices and evidence-based strategies to manage substance use and mental health conditions. Mm. Thank you, Courtney. I, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of a very complicated and very important topic, but I so appreciate you introducing it to us. I'll let you take a break now uh, and um, I'll invite Christina to come back on and we'll get a chance to to, to uh, learn, uh, learn from her. Thank you, Christina. Could you help us again, a little more of your background? And I'll ask the same question. What got you into working with suicide prevention? Uh, what a challenging area and thank you first for doing that. So give us a bit of your journey and how you got to where you are. Absolutely. So I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Um, I was studying biology pre-med, if you may, as a bachelor's degree, but then decided that I actually wanted to do public health and work more in upstream, you know, efforts and initiatives. So after I moved to Idaho a few years ago, I decided to get my master's. Um, it's in health sciences, which is similar to public health at Boise State University. And then when I started working at Central District Health, a week later, the stay at home order in Idaho. Two weeks later, we received funding for suicide prevention. So something that became very important, very fast in all of our districts. Um, so it's something that we're still laying the foundation for at a district level, making sure that all seven districts in Idaho have a suicide prevention plan in place, that we have a coalition slash committee that's working just to make sure that we're not siloed in our efforts. Um, so yeah, so this last year has been really about laying out the foundation, being able to have research and data to arm ourselves with to make sure that we're heading in the right direction and then hopefully be able to reduce uh, the burden of suicide in Idaho. 
Oh, what a wonderful goal. Um, and so thank you for coming into this field because it was needed uh, and being at the right place at the right time. Uh, so I'm so, so thankful for uh, your work. So how has the pandemic um, affected suicide in our region? Uh, what, yeah. what, what's happening? Yeah, so that is a very good question, a very complicated question. Um, so overall, it's not surprising that with this pandemic and you know all the stay at home and quarantine orders were put in place, it's not surprising that people were quickly concerned with suicide and being able to prevent that. Um, a lot of the things that have happened throughout the pandemic, which is you know being isolated, losing that connection that we have with each other's not being able to participate in activities. Um, like I mentioned before, if we were receiving care, not being able to access that care. All those are things that typically exacerbate the risk of suicide um, and everything happened at once. Um, and we weren't able to easily speak to a lot of people about it as we all navigated this pandemic. So in the past, nationally and internationally, some pandemics have been associated with increased risks of suicide. So the US actually reported an increase in suicide during the Spanish flu of 1918 and 19. Um, in Hong Kong back in 2003, during their SARS outbreak, there was also an increased um, surge in suicide, um, similar with Africa with their Ebola epidemic. And all of those factors are pretty similar in nature. So factors such as you know, economic recession overnight, losing your job, losing that income, feeling anxiety over possibly getting infected with COVID, um, all the, the news stories and all the information about you know, things that were scary because they were very new to us and everything was just scary at the same time. Um, having pre-existing conditions such as anxiety and depression, all of that together definitely, you know, shows that there is a concern and that we need to do everything in our power to prevent suicide. So I would say that overall, there are very a lot of risk factors that were exacerbated. Um, and I'd be happy to go into some data in regards to that. I don't have a whole lot of data. Um, and that kind of speaks positively about Valley County, the fact that this is a very relational and very well-connected community. Um, when you go to access data, because a lot of individuals could be possibly identified um, and there isn't a whole lot of it, I wasn't able to access data, but I'd be happy to talk about some age groups and some trends that we've seen in the past few years. Well, thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, so this are, these are the suicide deaths that occurred in Valley County um, by month from 2018 to 2020. So here we see the years on the left side, on the top we see the months, and then the totals. I do wanna add a small caveat, these are not trends, um, these are not rates, I should say, these aren't rates per population, these are just the numbers that we have so far. And when we see here, 2018, there were actually more suicides in 2018 than there were in 2019 and 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to add that you know there might be some reports that we're missing. We might there might be some data that we're missing, but this is kind of what we have so far. So when we split that up by age group down here, 2020 being in red, we see that those three suicide deaths that occurred in 2020 happened between one of them between 18 and 24 one of them between 35 and 44, and then another one um, with the 85 plus community. Um, I was trying to access some data through vital statistics to know um, what the emergency room visits were because that can show us a trend when it comes to suicide attempts. But again, that wasn't information that they were able to access right now. But this data, it's specific to Valley County, but it's on trend with Idaho and it's on trend with national. Um, nationally, there hasn't been a huge surge reported yet. Um, and 2018 was actually a particularly bad um, year for Idaho when it came to suicide. So that's not to say that the pandemic might have might not have long-term effects on suicide. It may very well have, um, but that's not data that we've been able to capture so far. Um, nationally, internationally, we don't have a whole lot of concrete data when it comes to the relationship between pandemics and um, 
suicide because luckily there haven't been a lot of pandemics in our lifetime. But because of that, um, we don't know what we're going to see, you know, six months from now, a year from now. That may very well change. Um, I did found some research that says that typically right after a natural disaster, and that can include a pandemic, sometimes suicide rates do decrease. And that could be due to a honeymoon phase or a pulling together phenomenon where there's increased connectedness to each other, providing that support to each other. So sometimes we see um, it decline, those suicide rates decline. But then, you know, once that long-term effect starts to hit, when you're not able to go back to a career that you were in, or when you have developed some sort of mental health condition during the pandemic, those are some of the long-term effects that um, we might not see for a few months to a year. Excellent. Okay. I, I found the graph to be surprising in, in the sense of, of how the community is perceiving suicide. I think we perceive that suicide has tended to affect the young, but your graph seems to really put it across the spectrum. Um, could you speak a bit to, again, I'm, I'm thankful we're focused on the young, I'm thankful we're worried about them, but we really need to have, the, the data says it's across the board. Could you speak to that sort of common sense and what we how we really need to interpret this data? Right. So in this pandemic, the youth is definitely considered a vulnerable population. Um, their education has been disrupted. Those extracurricular activities have been disrupted. Um, they might be at home and connected to their phone more often than they would be if they had to go to school for a few hours out of the day. So that concern is not out there, if you may. That concern is very valid. That concern is very logical because life has been uprooted for many of the youth. Um, yes, suicide is across the board, but there are certain things that are specific to the youth and that can include you know, online bullying, harassment, um, substance use. There's a lot of um, different risk factors that may, might be a little bit more specific to the youth that we do need to be concerned about and make sure that we are addressing it. But you are correct, suicide is across the board. Um, at a national level, suicide is actually most common among white males who are middle age. Um, but yes, I, I, I can certainly speak to just that natural concern over youth and making sure that they have their resources and making sure that they know that they need to, you know, speak to someone if they are having those thoughts of suicide. Mm. Boy, that's so important. Mm -hmm. Suicide often has a trigger that causes the suicide. And I'm wondering in, in, in your background, if you sort of can give us like some cueing on what are the dominant triggers that induce someone to even consider suicide? What are you seeing in your work? Sure. So um, when we talk about triggers and suicide prevention, that's typically split between risk factors and warning signs. So I'm gonna go through um, a list of the risk factors. So the, these are the factors that might increase the likelihood of someone having these thoughts of suicide and then the warning signs. So this is when someone's already kind of going through the crisis. Um, what are these warning signs that lets us know that this person is thinking about it or planning on dying by suicide? So I'll go ahead and start with the risk factors and kind of everything that's under that umbrella. Um, that can be split into more topics. So when we talk about, about a risk factor, that could be specific to health. Um, so the mental health conditions that we've been um, sort of talking about, so experiencing depression, experiencing anxiety, um, experiencing substance use problems, personal, personality traits, such as aggression, mood changes, poor relationships. Um, it can also be a health factor such as a traumatic brain injury or it could be chronic pain. So individuals who have been in pain for many years, oftentimes those people are at a very high risk of dying by suicide or attempting suicide. Then we also talk about environmental risk factors. So this could be access to lethal means and that could include firearms or drugs or substance uses, um, prolonged stress, such as harassment, bullying, relationship problems or unemployment stressful life events like rejection, divorce, 
financial crisis, other life transitions or loss, um, and then exposure to another person's suicide or to graphic and sensationalized accounts of suicide. So um, when a person who is very well loved, admired, um, very well known dies by suicide, there is a phenomenon called suicide contagion. And because it increases the chances of other, especially the youth, um, who may look up to an athlete or look up to an actor, um, there's, there's an increased risk of they also, you know, having suicidal ideation or attempting suicide. So that is another example of environmental risk factor. We also have historical risk factors. So previous suicide attempts, a family history of suicide, um, childhood abuse, neglect, or trauma. Those are the, the, the risk factors. Then we have the warning signs. Talking, when a person talks about killing themselves, when they talk about feeling hopeless, when they talk about having no reason to live, um, finding themselves being a burden to others, feeling trapped, feeling unbearable pain, that is a warning sign, very, a very common warning sign of suicide. Another common one has to do with a person's behavior. So when they increase the use of alcohol or substances, when they look for ways to end their lives, either because they search it on the internet or they start reading about it, um, withdrawing from activities or losing interest from things that typically they're interested in. So if someone plays sports and now they're not interested in sports and it's someone that you know loves this sport, that could be one of those warning signs. Um, isolating themselves from family or friends, sleeping too little, too much, calling loved ones to say goodbye or giving away prized um, possessions. Uh, also experiencing increased aggressiveness or aggression and um, fatigue as well. Mood changes are also a warning sign. So someone who is explaining one or a few of these moods, such as depression, anxiety, loss of interest, um, feeling humiliation, feeling shame, feeling agitation, feeling anger. So again, those, those, those are the risk factors and that is composed of many different things. And then the warning signs that someone may, you know, be having these thoughts or be, may be planning to die by suicide. Wow, those are really, really helpful. Um, and, and you can see how the pandemic would have disrupted so many Right. Uh, of the items on your on either list. And mm -hmm. so that uh, that sort of is cueing us as to how do we sort of rebuild our relationships so that we can right. take care of each other. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that's that's such an important um, step that I think we all have to work on when it comes to helping each other move move through this area. One of the areas that I studied when I had a, when I was doing my work in sociology um, was the reality that one's community has an influence on on uh, thoughts or ideation uh, that lead to suicide, and and you sort of place those within the environmental factors. I'm wondering if you could sort of grow those ideas. How does how does our community construct those ideas around someone that we need to be aware of? Yeah, so a very simple, but sometimes it can inquire a little bit of cost would be training. Um, a lot of people think that being trained and looking for those warning signs and those risk factors means that you have to be a mental health professional or you have to be um, you know, a teacher, but they, essentially anyone can um, you know, do a 30 minute training and be like, oh, you know what? So-and-so used to be very interested in that. And I've realized that They've isolated themselves a bit and they've been disengaged. And then that could just require like a quick check-in, just a phone call to that person. So um, being able to correctly identify those risk factors helps immensely. Um, reducing stigma, so feeling comfortable talking about it. Sometimes it can make, it can feel a little bit uneasy to ask someone, hey, are, are you okay? But that can make a huge difference. And if someone is a part of a community where we can frankly and candidly talk about suicide and preventing suicide, um, those individuals who are experiencing those thoughts may feel more inclined to you know, let someone know that they need help or they just need someone to listen to them. So when a community comes together and they're able to want to address this, and there is a toolkit that I'd be more than happy to pull up, created by the World Health Organization. Um, it's about creating some sort of community forum where both leaders of the community and members of the community can meet together, 
have these conversations and have a community action plan that strategizes and prioritizes suicide prevention initiatives. And that could be, you know, having like a phone banking check-in where people can check in on with each other. It could also mean having events either virtually or safely outside, just to make sure that that connectedness is there. And that way, um, you know, people might feel more likely to engage if they know that they're in a safe community where they can express these thoughts and they can share that, you know, they do need the help. Um, another very important element, and Courtney touched this, is just having these resources and just systematically having these supports in place. Um, so that could either be by implementing more resources, such as lost survivor groups. So these are groups for people who have lost someone to suicide, but it could also it could also be something as promoting the resources that are available. So Courtney mentioned, you know, this, the couple of counseling locations that are there. So I know St. Luke's has a behavioral health clinic. Um, and then there's also, and I forgot the name, um, the counseling that Courtney mentioned earlier, being able to promote and letting people like, hey, this is a resource that's there. That is also something that as a community, we can come together and, and really highly encourage people to access these services. Excellent. Courtney, come on back. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, it, I would be pleased if you got, I mean, it, is there anything I, that we really need to get on the table from either one of your perspectives um, that you, you just really feel is important? Uh, or is there a question you have for each other? But let's start with the most important. Is there anything we missed so far that we really should talk about? I was thinking, um, we, we talk about the value of accessing resources, but where do you go to get help and where do you go to find these resources? Yeah. Um, I think The Rock is a phenomenal um, asset in that way and that they have their own resource list that we're working with and that they're working with in the community to know what's happening and operational hours and funding payments, all that kind of stuff. Um, here through the Drug Overdose Prevention Program, we've also developed a resource list that's an interactive guide so folks can look at a massive spreadsheet for regional resources, and they can also narrow that down to specific resources in their county. So if they're, they wanna know where their local food pantry is, if they wanna know where to find housing assistance, if they wanna know where their nearest medication assisted treatment provider is, they can go to this list and find it. And then they can also use uh, the interactive maps that we have to get directions directly to that facility and then use Google to call that facility if they have the option to mm -hmm. with cellular uh, data. Um, so I think that's a, a great thing to talk about is to, and as well as what Christina mentioned, breaking the stigma around substance use, breaking the stigma around addressing behavioral health and talking about suicidal ideation is so important. Regardless of what field a person is in, they have the immediate an intimate ability of being able to help someone um, by being able to talk about those things and to feel comfortable to do so if they themselves are struggling with any one of those things. Mm. So that's the only thing I would highlight. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Christina, anything that you're, you, you'd like to make sure we talk about before we uh, bring some conclusion tonight? Yeah, um, so in addition to everything that Courtney mentioned, um, I agree that the digital social connectedness is very important. Um, and now as you know, more people are vaccinated and cases have gone low, um, a lot of you know, outdoors community events might be safer um, and having a place where people can just talk to each other. That will definitely help decrease the chances of someone, um, you know, attempting suicide or having these thoughts. Um, making sure that there's equitable access to the mental health facilities, and like Courtney mentioned, if we were to have in place some sort of resource map where people can access these resources and have information on them, absolutely very important. Um, and making sure that we, you know, remember those vulnerable populations, so the elderly who are disproportionately isolated. Um, and that is something that's been a huge concern over the last year, the youth, um, racial minorities, and our frontline healthcare workers as well, who are fatigued, um, burnt out, and also might, you know, be experiencing mental health as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'd sort of like to, I, I'll, I'll just direct this to Courtney, uh, and then I'll come back to you, Christina. Uh, what's the post-pandemic world look like? through your eyes. 
What are you sensing is coming towards us? Uh, and then how, uh, and then go into our, you know, in, into the specialization of, of our drug overdose, but what are you sensing is coming towards us now? I think it's realistic to say that um, the overdose rate that we're experiencing, fatal or non-fatal, is, is going to continue to rise okay. um, with the understanding that synthetic opioids are in our supplies. I think um, when I think about that question about what the post-pandemic world could look like, to me, I think about the idealistic version of a world that I would like to create for myself and that as a, a member of the community, I would want to be a part of. So I'd love to have a community that was um, kind of using our strengths to be able to support our most vulnerable residents, uh, mm -hmm. to have a community that is supporting individuals in recovery or in use in any phase of their continuum of care. Um, individuals that feel comfortable to engage in a conversation wherever they're at, if that means that they're at Ridley's or if that means that they're at the McCall Beachfront, um, anywhere that that looks like to them. Um, knowing how to ask for help and building some of those coping skills that help in, um, ensure resiliency in a community um, is really helpful. And something that I think is particularly important going back to the education piece that Christina talked about, knowing how to prevent an overdose, knowing how to respond to an overdose is critical. Um, knowing where to access tools that prevent an intentional or accidental overdose um, and how to be able to address substance use with a non-judgmental, uncoercive harm reduction approach that helps break down some of that stigma and really helps meet people where they're at. Um, so that's, I would like to use the advantages of the community that I'm in or the community that I would be a part of in order to be able to create a better post-pandemic world than what we had before where there was a lot of stigma regarding behavioral health conditions and normalizing that so that people feel comfortable to be able to address those things as they arise. Um, and then there have been advantages with the, um, you know, to look at it that way with the pandemic and that Valley County and other rural regions across the state of Idaho and the United States have really built, developed a robust telehealth and telemedicine mm -hmm. um, system. That's been really helpful for people. Um, and if they don't have immediate access to that in terms of internet um, or in terms of a device that can play it, there are community uh, recovery centers or crisis centers across the state that have developed uh, computer labs, including the ROC, to be able to support people to get tapped into that resource. Um, and then really working towards building a robust, informed workforce that's trauma-informed and uses those evidence-based best practices to address substance use and behavioral health conditions in our community. I think the advantages when looking at Valley County is because it is such a relational community, it is so much more able to be impactful um, regarding overdose and substance use and suicidal ideation than other counties across the state um, because they have a very a connected way of working with each other. And that is entirely beneficial when addressing some of the isolation and vulnerabilities around any one of those conditions. Wow, that's really a, a helpful vision for our future. Thank you, Courtney. Christine, I'm going to send the same question back to you. What, what does that post-pandemic world look like to you and the area of your concerns? Yeah, so both um, drug overdose prevention and suicide prevention have a lot of overlapping. So mm. everything that Courtney says, yes, let's have that for a post-pandemic world. Um, so there's no need to repeat that. Um, in addition to all of those resources and um, facilitating access um, and facilitating um, more education and promotion of this health. Um, I would say ending the stigma is a big deal. So we, we won't be able to address suicide um, and help prevent it if we don't end the stigma behind it. I think with the pandemic, um, there's been more conversations regarding suicide than they have been in previous years. And I think we really need to take advantage of the fact that this has been at the forefront of our minds um, and not let it fall to the wayside even after we go back to normal. So yes, suicide is, was very concerning during the pandemic. It should still be our priority after the pandemic. So not decreasing our efforts, not decreasing our attention towards it, just continuing towards that. Um, and then, you know, after we can break that first barrier, um, everything in regarding the system and making sure that we have a robot, robust access to all of these resources, um, it'll, it'll be 
more helpful if we can just break that stigma. Mm, that's wonderful. I'd like to I'd like to you to respond to a strategy that I'm trying as to whether as to whether it works or whether we can can think about it more. And as I talk to people around me, I'm just saying I think we've all had our mental health affected. I think it's a universal problem. Um, and for my generation, boy, did we sublimate it. We pushed it so down into the ground that we never had to talk about it. I am very thankful that the, 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 our most recent generations aren't using that strategy. And so for me and my generation, I'm trying to talk about it because I think it's very true. I think our mental health has been affected. I think it is, uh, it, it's shaping our behavioral health. Um, and so that's my strategy is just trying to make it a conversation point with my community. Um, how does that one sound? Yeah, I think it sounds great. The, the more we talk about it, the more it's something that we remember from day to day. Um, if we don't talk about it, then it's some secret that we have to keep to ourselves because it's, it's bad. It's a bad you know, thing to share with everybody and we don't want anybody to know if that's something that we're all very frank about, um, then others can be like, oh, you know what? I'm also you know, having these thoughts. And I'm also um, have found that my mental health has suffered over the last year. I think one, once it becomes a part of our day-to-day -day conversation, it becomes something that it, we put a spotlight on and then we can work towards addressing it. Thank you. Uh, Courtney, any additional thought on that one? I would absolutely agree. I think it's important to recognize um, that everyone has a unique experience managing behavioral health, and they may have pre-existing or family or genetic conditions that can exacerbate those, but the pandemic has absolutely made it very difficult for a lot of folks um, because their entire life shifted. Um, so by talking about, you know, how are you and being able to openly, honestly, transparently, and with trust answer that question, when it's given to you, not just saying, I'm fine. Um, that is key. Uh, and being able to create a bridge of connection and empathy and trust with people, mm. that changes culture. And that changes an under a person's individual perspective of how they're doing. Um, and that's, that's really important. So even just bringing it up, as Christina mentioned, talking about it normalizes it, breaks down the stigma and helps support people that are in a position that they might need help. So mm. I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, and before we before we let you let you uh, uh, move off camera, I'd like for you to have an opportunity. This is live TV, and one of the scary parts of live TV is you would love to restate something, but you're not. Is there anything you're a little bit worried about that you might want to restate from anything we've talked about tonight? I want to give you an opportunity to to uh, make any amendments or adjustments on anything you've said. Christina, are you okay? I cannot think of anything, but thank you for giving us the opportunity to do so. <laughs> thank you. And Courtney, are you okay? I also appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm sure there would be something that I will discover in the shower tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Um, but as of tonight, uh, I would just certainly hope that the public, if they do have questions, to know that Christina and I are more than comfortable to be able to answer those and to talk to them and be able to, um, be able to clear up any clarification points that they might have. Excellent. The last thing I'd like to do is resources. And Courtney, I'll stay with you. Um, and would you, would you, uh, and it's something I'm going to try and put on the screen, you know, up here, can't even see it. Um, and, and once I uh, once I get there, once we, once I do some editing here, I'm going to put the uh, the the numbers or the URLs, uh, the internet sites right there. Uh, and so I'd encourage you if you would just sort of highlight Courtney the the specific resources that you would like to have people available. This is if you've been watching this, write this down and stick this on your fridge stuff because it's important to all of us. Courtney, what would you like to highlight as far as available resources that our region needs to be using when needed? Sure, I think a big one is 211. Very easy, use 211. 
Um, if you are wanting to research something on the internet, I would type into Google Central District Health Drug Overdose Prevention Program. Our page will pop up and we have a whole section of resources there um, that can connect people to varying resources, including the suicide prevention hotline, caregiver support, recovery support services, harm reduction, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I do talk about harm reduction a lot. I think a really important resource would be the Idaho Harm Reduction Project. They ship overdose prevention tools like naloxone, which can reverse a medication directly to people's homes for free. Um, and they do that across the state. And that is something that people can walk away with today or at least start the process today to address substance use in their community by knowing how to use naloxone. Um, and that's a really important resource that more people should be able to utilize comfortably at, at work, at home, in places that they recreate, worship, anywhere that people tend to be. So I would start with 211, uh, type in Central District Health Drug Overdose Prevention Program, and then I would look at um, the Idaho Harm Reduction Project.org. Their uh, page is great. They have a number that people can call or text to request supplies. So those would be the places I would start. Great list. Christina, same question. Yes, so number one would be the Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, I'll quickly say their phone number. So that's 800-273-8255. And again, that's 800-273-8255. So a lot of times when people are going through a crisis, um, expecting that they find a crisis center or a counseling center is just not doable. And especially if it happens in the middle of the night. Um, so being able to call this hotline, there's also an option to text them, um, call this hotline, they're able to indicate, you know, what resources are available. So, so similar to the 211, but a little bit more specific to um, suicide. Um, another resource would be Pathways of Idaho Community Crisis Center. So they are located in... Could you say that again? I don't think I caught that. Apologies. So, it says, so it's actually Pathways Community Crisis Center of Southwest Idaho. So if someone is going through a crisis, they're able to provide 24 hours of care and then potentially transfer that person to the next phase um, to get additional treatment and help them go through the process. So they're located in Boise. However, they do have a transportation service um, and I do know that they provide those services to Valley County. So again, that is information that you can grab from the hotline, that Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline, and potentially there is that additional resource where someone can go grab you through their vehicle, take you to this crisis center and provide 24 hour treatment and care. Hmm. Really helpful. I want to thank both of you for the amazing amount of time you have dedicated to Valley County and to this opportunity of sharing it tonight. We so appreciate you uh, and please thank your family and your families uh, for allowing us to take you away from, that, from them tonight. We so appreciate your time, the expertise you've brought to the topic and to the way you've set the table for us in, 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 for our, our conversations. Um, and so thank you. I'd invite you now to slip your cameras off and I'll speak to you in just a moment uh, as we close. Wow, that was wonderful. And uh, I trust you learned as much as I learned uh, as to how we could deal with these two very important problems. And they're problems that come to each and every family. Uh, and it often comes at cr in crisis and it's difficult to know where to turn. And so my plan is to make these resources available to you. And I hope you will make a plan too, to make sure these resources are available to you. So thank you uh, for uh, our guests tonight. This is our first of four conversations and I'm very much looking forward to next week's conversation. It will be with a, a counselor uh, and her name is Katie Stoll. And Katie Stoll will bring some expertise on how we can reset our relationships back to normal. And what we'll be focusing on is coping with pandemic depression, trauma, and anxiety. And I'm sure, like me, you've got some of those. Depression, trauma, and anxiety. 
it's called COVID-19 for a year and a half. And so I really look forward to rethinking how we can all reset our relationships to a better normal. And so these conversations we trust you have enjoyed. And we now have all seven of our previous conversations online. And those conversations were on vaccine hesitancy. And so you'll find those uh, at www.youtube.com front slash McCall College. And McCall College is all one word. And if you type that in or get on YouTube, uh, put, uh, put McCall College one word into the search engine. And I think you'll find those previous seven lectures. And over the course of May, we'll be putting up each of the lectures and you'll have access to, to tonight's and all of our future lectures. And, uh, and I trust those conversations will be enjoyable to you. If you'd like more information about the series, please go to www.mccallcollege, one word again, dot org, O-R-G, mccallcollege.org. If you'd like more information uh, from us, feel free to drop an email to us at information at mccallcollege.org and we'll try and get information out to you. We thank you for watching tonight. We hope we'll see you next Thursday night at 7 p.m. for our next community conversation on COVID-19 on YouTube. <music>